This podcast is brought to you by Dr. Kirk Elliott, PhD. In an uncertain economy, if you're looking for wealth management solutions and financial advice, go to kirkelliottphd.com and make an appointment today. Coming up, I'll discuss the compatibility of Islam and the West by tracing the rise and development of Islam and its modern political expression in nations around the world, including the U.S. Author and radio host Alex McFarlane joins me. He's going to make the case that Islam is a threat to the principles of the American Constitution. We will see. Hey, if you're watching on uh, Rumble or listening on Apple, Google, or Spotify, please subscribe to my channel. This is the Dinesh Souza Show. <laughs> this voice. The times are crazy in a time of confusion, division, and lies. We need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. I want to focus today on the theme of Islam and the West, Islam and America. And I have an interesting guest who makes the case that Islam is incompatible with the U.S. Constitution. Uh, I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it isn't. I'm actually not so sure. And so what I'm going to do in the interview is just try to spring some devil's advocate objections and questions to sort of test this idea of whether or not, let's say, one can be a devout and orthodox Muslim who believes the Quran from beginning to end is such a person able to sort of fit in or assimilate or be part of the American experiment? That's what we're going to be talking about. But I want to, before I get there, uh, I want to talk about Kevin McCarthy and his uh, resignation from Congress uh, at the end of this year. Now, why? Why? Uh, I realize that Kevin McCarthy is upset. Uh, I realize that he feels displaced and sort of booted out because he was booted out. Uh, he was booted out by uh, the fact that he had agreed to a set of rules which allowed a relatively small number of conservatives in the House to pull their support uh, and McCarthy could no longer get a majority. So he, he needed to sort of hold the whole Republican camp together, or he needed to get Democrats to defect over to his side and vote to keep him as speaker. The Democrats decided, we're not going to be helping him. You Republicans sort this one out. Uh, Matt Gates and others pulled out the rug and down went McCarthy. So I don't think McCarthy wants to stay in Congress because he's like, you know, I used to be the speaker. Now I'm just a run of the mill. But wait a minute. I mean, Nancy Pelosi used to be the speaker. Now she's a run of the mill, uh, but she's still in Congress. And um, and more importantly, McCarthy should surely recognize that the Republicans have a razor thin majority. So it, it would have been pretty easy for McCarthy to say, all right, I'll, I'm going to stick it out through the next election. Uh, I'm not going to get out midstream because if you get out midstream, there's going to be a special election in his district. So you have all that not only the the uh, inconvenience of having a special election, but the uncertain outcome of it. And, and what is McCarthy doing? The last I saw him, he was criticizing the Republican Party. In fact, he was saying the Democrats, after all, look like America, but the Republican Party looks like some restrictive country club. Now, why would you say that? First of all, you've been the leader for quite a long time, uh, and you had every effort to try to diversify the Republican Party in a good way, uh, not through affirmative action or some sort of quotas, but through trying to maybe attract younger people people from different backgrounds. I do think we need to be, uh, I don't disagree with the idea that a multiracial Republican party is a good thing uh, and more effective politically, more likely to be able to win power in this country. So I think my question for McCarthy is, why don't you put your party first? Why don't you put your country first? Why don't you recognize that, well, first of all, the, the GOP gets together and boots uh, George Santos down goes your majority. Now we have McCarthy. Um, so I think this brings the Republican majority after December down to two or maybe even one. So how do you expect to impeach Joe Biden? Even if, even if the facts all point, as I think they will, unequivocally to Biden, even if you find you know checks written by the Chinese government to Biden, the truth of it is to proceed with impeachment. 
let's leave aside whether impeachment could even succeed because it can't succeed in the Senate. You can't get the supermajority of votes you need. But you can have impeachment in the House and then Joe Biden will be impeached and there will be a trial. All of that would be politically very valuable for Republicans. But I predict it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen regardless of the evidence. Why? Because the Republicans who already had a thin majority have narrowed it so much by, by their own actions, by the actions of the majority of Republicans who vote to boot Sa uh, George Santos. The huge mistake. No reason to boot George Santos at all. Well, George Santos is a liar. <laughs> oh, yeah, really? <laughs> well, guess how many liars there are in Congress? Uh, Menendez is a liar and he's sitting fat and pretty in the Senate. Democrats aren't stupid. They're not going to kick their own guy out to the curb. So they're, they've taken him off a committee, sure, but he's still in the Senate. He's still voting with the Democrats. So this, these are self-inflicted wounds. One inflicted, I would say, by the majority of the GOP on itself, and now one inflicted on the GOP and the country by its former uh, House leader and House Speaker, Kevin McCarthy. My name is Mark Lichtenfeld, best-selling author of Get Rich with Dividends and chief income strategist at the Oxford Club, one of the world's largest and most prominent financial firms where over 250,000 readers receive my insights each week. I believe we're entering the greatest oil bull market since the 1970s. That's why I'm so excited to share this special oil and gas investment with you today. I've discovered an unusual way to potentially bank massive income from the oil and gas surge 100% outside the stock market. Oil and gas royalties are a backdoor way to get paid over and over again, and you can get into a top royalty stream for just $25. This is your chance to get the income you need to truly enjoy life. Simply because you made the decision to give the Oxford Income Letter a risk-free try today. But this opportunity won't last forever. To learn more about Mark Lichtenfeld's unusual approach to generating monthly income from the oil markets, please visit oilpayday.com. That's oilpayday.com. Paid for by the Oxford Club. I am um, going to interview in this podcast a fellow that I've known for some years. His name is Alex McFarland. And he's a Christian apologist. He is head of Christian worldview at a Bible college called Karis Bible College. And apparently in recent years, he has been focusing on the question of the compatibility of Islam and the American Constitution, a very kind of interesting uh, idea. Now, Alex has been studying Islam ever since his own college days when he studied comparative religion and different types of worldviews. But he's going to make in this discussion the provocative argument that you can't reconcile Islam with the Constitution. Or to put it differently, if somebody is, let's say, a devout Muslim, and devout in the full sense of the term. By the way, we're not talking here about a terrorist or something. We're talking about somebody, for example, who believes the Quran from start to finish, accepts concepts like Sharia law. Uh, can such a guy live in America? Um, live according to Islam and yet according to the Constitution, or is there some kind of contradiction in terms? Now, I confess that when Alex sort of proposed this topic to me and Debbie, Debbie's like, do you want to do this? I was like, you know, I actually don't even know the answer to that question. Uh, obviously, I've written about Islam myself. Some years ago, I published a book called The Enemy at Home, focused on not so much theological Islam, but political Islam. And I learned a lot of things about Islam in the course of that book. But not only that, I've obviously grown up with Muslims. I grew up in a country that is predominantly Hindu, India, about 80 to 85 percent Hindus, but then almost 15 percent of Muslims with a small smattering of Christians and, and others. But the Hindus and the Muslims are, are the most uh, in the country. And so I've had a pretty direct exposure to people uh, practicing Islam and practicing Islam in the sort of full sense of the term. Uh, right down my street, for example, was a guy, a Muslim guy, uh, and I knew his son. We would actually play cricket and other sports together. And this guy actually had two wives. So this is apparently allowed under Indian law. In other words, Indian law is that you can only have one wife. But if you're a Muslim, you kind of fall under Islamic law, which is, of course, enforced not by the normal Indian courts, but by Islamic courts. And this guy evidently was permitted to have 
a Muslim wife and a Christian wife, oddly enough, uh, who lived in a separate residence. And in fact, I never saw or met the other wife, but I often heard about it. And so this is a kind of a strange, I thought even as a kid, this was really weird. Uh, but on the other hand, you've had Hindus and Muslims existing, not, by the way, always peacefully for a long time in India. But what about America? What about American exceptionalism? What about the principles of the American founding? Well, I begin with the, the starting point that these principles are today in America very frayed. And by that, I mean, we don't live by those principles in terms of our current set of laws. Um, uh, the If our constitution is based on a Judeo-Christian foundation, if it's based on objective morality, do we have objective morality behind our laws? Uh, do we have natural law governing, for example, our, our practices of marriage? No. Ever since the Supreme Court sort of just blatantly just declared gay marriage is okay, gay marriage is allowed in the Constitution, and um, suddenly you discover that we're living in a kind of a new America. So for me, it's not just a question of whether Islam is compatible with the original America, with the Constitution the way it was originally understood, with the objective morality that used to be the kind of agreed upon basis of our society and our laws, but with America today, which seems to be an America that's moved away from all that, that's in flux, that is under assault from a left that would totally change the country. And the question for me is, is in that situation, in this very fluid environment, is Islam an ally? Is it an enemy? Should we as conservatives be open to conservative Muslims who may not agree with us on theology? Uh, I mean, they would reject, for example, that Jesus is the Messiah, but guess what? Jews do too. Jews don't only just reject that Jesus is the Messiah, Jews think that Jesus, in a sense, was a fraud. Jesus was pretending to be the Messiah, but some other guy who hasn't shown up yet is the real Messiah. So which is closer to Christianity, Islam or, or Judaism? The guys who say that Jesus was a prophet but not the Messiah, or the guys who say that Jesus was not a prophet and not the Messiah and a complete fraud? So I wrestle with these kinds of questions and my thought with having Alex on is, all right, Alex, you're going to make your case and I'm going to sort of prod it and probe it and question you, not because we all have clear views on the subject, but we want some clarity to emerge out of our current confusion. Debbie and I are on a really good health journey, but we still struggle to eat enough fruits, veggies, and fiber, and those are a requirement. Now, lucky for us, we discovered Balance of Nature. What better way to get all your fruits and veggies plus fiber than with Balance of Nature? This is Balance of Nature's fruits and veggies in a capsule easy to take, made from fresh whole produce. The produce is powdered after an advanced vacuum cold process, which stabilizes the maximum nutrient content. And this is Balance of Nature's Fiber and Spice, a proprietary blend of fiber and 12 spices for overall and digestive health. Join Debbie and me, start your journey to better health right now. Call 800-246-8751 or go to balanceofnature.com. You get 35% off your first preferred order by using discount code AMERICA. Again, it's balanceofnature.com or call 800-246-8751. Get 35% off your first preferred order by using discount code AMERICA. Guys, I'm really happy to welcome to the podcast my friend Alex McFarland. He is the he runs Alex McFarland Ministries. He's a youth religion and culture expert. He's author of more than 20 books. He's heard live daily on the 200 plus stations of the American Family Radio Network. He's also director of Worldview for Karis Bible College in Colorado and co-hosts the Truth and Liberty TV broadcast. Uh, Alex, welcome. Good to see you. Uh, Gosh, you and I met now, it seems like a decade ago or so, when we were both, um, well, I was uh, doing apologetics, you invited me to speak in North Carolina, I think that was the first time we got acquainted, was it not? It probably was, and uh, <laughs> let me say, my respect for you was strong then, over the years it's only grown, and uh, I really, uh, no, no flattery here, my friend, but uh, you are one of those intellects and voices that I'm so profoundly grateful for. It's always a privilege to visit with you, Dinesh. Alex, that means a lot. Uh, thank you for saying that. By the way, Alex's website is Alex McFarland, M-C-F-A-R-L-A-N-D, alexmcfarland.com. Uh, Alex, I thought I'd like to 
focus on a topic that you've been thinking and writing about, which is the compatibility of Islam with the West and perhaps specifically with the U.S. Constitution. So let me begin by asking, as a guy who's been talking about Christian worldview, Christian apologetics, how did you develop this interest in Islam? Well, it is very interesting, Dinesh. My interest in Islam predates 9-11. Let me just say that. I think so much of, of Americans and the West became familiar with Islam in the aftermath of 9-11. And I, I, you know, as a minister and going to seminary and graduate school, uh, I'm learning world religions. And I did really in the late 90s kind of a deep dive into what Islam is and Islam's origins. And a lot of people don't realize that Islam, in the early years of the life of Muhammad, um, he had a lot of animus and really anger against what he perceived to be Christianity. He um, had some, he was in an orphanage, in fact, a, a, an orphanage in part of his young life. And he may have actually had epilepsy. Even some Muslim historians say that. Uh, suffice it to say, Muhammad was a labor-intensive orphan, and he was put out. And interestingly, and this is worth laying some groundwork, early in Christianity, there was a group called Nestorians. They were under a guy named Nestorius, and Nestorius denied the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the young Muhammad, after he left an orphanage at about age 15, went to live with an uncle I'm probably, with my southern accent, probably going to butcher the pronunciation of this, but Muhammad went to live with a man named Waraka ibn Nofal. And again, my apologies if I mispronounced that, but um, Waraka ibn Nofal was a Nestorian, a vehement denier of the Trinity and the deity of Christ. And so my point is, one of the core doctrines of Islamic theology is the oneness of God, and the denial of the fact of Jesus Christ being deity. Now, I studied this in depth, Dinesh, because I wanted to know, as I traveled the world, how to dialogue with Muslims. When 9-11 happened, um, there was a book that really I recommended many people read by Samuel Huntington called The Clash of Civilizations. Uh, do you recall that book, Dinesh? Yeah, of course. Should... I remember it well. I. I think the, yeah. the two books that most influenced me around that time were Bernard Lewis's What Went Wrong, which was built on a whole lifetime of his work with Islam, and the other was Huntington's Clash of Civilizations, a widely discussed book, which did talk about the fact that there were many civilizations coming into conflict, but the highlight, the focus, was on Islam and the West. It really was, and Huntington, who was a 50-year professor at Harvard and was... Uh, participating in the Carter administration, brilliant academic, and I think he's worth citing for a couple of reasons. One, his work was, in my opinion, meticulous. The other thing is, I mean, he's not some right-wing evangelical. Um, he couldn't be accused of being an ideologue, really. And Huntington said that Westerners are very naive to believe that, um, you know, devout Muslims will really assimilate into Western culture. And I know during the Obama years, you know, we were constantly told and unsuspecting Americans probably did not realize they were being misled. But uh, Obama constantly talked about how Islam had been a part of America from the, the beginning and that uh, so much of the great things about tolerance and diversity and accomplishment were due to uh, Islam. And, and that is just simply not the case. And, and Dinesh, just let me, as a caveat, let me say what, what I'm saying is not of any ill will or attitude. I, I'm just trying to help people understand that the, our Judeo-Christian representative republic is not compatible with Sharia, which is what the, the hard-shell devout Muslims want for the world, not just for Europe and America, but the world. Now, can Muslims migrate here? Of course. Can they be citizens? Do they make good neighbors? Very often, yes and yes. But those of us that value our freedom and our, our nation, we must not ever allow uh, the U.S. Constitution or local laws to be abrogated by Islamic doctrine or Islamic uh, 
judicial protocols. And I'm saying this, and I realize I'm, you know, some might think that I'm some hateful white guy, but fundamental devout Islam is not compatible with our representative republic, and we cannot let it creep further and further into a force of influence. I'll be right back with Alex McFarland, the website alexmcfarland.com. Tubby and I made a New Year's resolution to lose weight, and we have. Thankfully, PhD weight loss came to our rescue. Debbie's lost 24 pounds. I've lost 27. We're keeping it off. We're both on maintenance. The program is based on science and nutrition. No injections, no pills, no long hours in the gym, no severe calorie restriction, just good, sound, scientifically proven nutrition. It's so simple. They make it easy by providing 80% of your food at no additional cost. They tell you when and what to eat. And guess what? You can do this without ever being hungry. The founder, Dr. Ashley Lucas, has her PhD in chronic disease and sports nutrition. She's also a registered dietitian. She helps people lose weight and most important, maintain that weight loss for life. So if you're ready to take the step of losing weight, like Debbie and I have called PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition at 864-644-1900. You can also find them online at myphdweightloss.com. The number again to call, 864-644-1900. I'm back with Alex McFarland. Alex, we were talking about the compatibility of Islam and the West. You mentioned Samuel Huntington, but I think what Huntington was really focusing on was the political aspirations of radical Islam, uh, its strategic objectives. And of course, radical Islam defines itself against the West, right? We think of a country like Iran as now uh, largely allied with Russia, allied with China, so it's forming a rival axis to the West. So we can totally understand that in those terms, there is not only an incompatibility, there's an outright adversary relationship between Islam as a political force and perhaps the political goals of the West. But I want to focus on something which I think is different that you said, which is that somehow Islam itself in the West poses a problem for our constitutional system of government. And I want to probe as to why you think that is the case. I mean, let me give an example maybe to drive the discussion. We have, for example, in the West, the idea of, you know, heterosexual marriage. That's been a a part of our law. This goes all the way back, you know, in its roots to the Reformation, uh, marriage laws made by the state. Now, on the one hand, you may have some, some Muslims who go, we want Sharia law, we want polygamy, you know, but guess what? We've got leftists in this country and we've got gay activists who would be very happy to throw out the marriage laws, establish polygamy for their own reasons. So what I'm getting at is, what makes the Islamic pursuit of this goal somehow different from, let's say, a secular guy who goes, I don't like the white male patriarchy and I want to get rid of these exact same marriage laws? Well, uh, that's a great question. And and this does really make a little bit for something rather delicate and uh, sticky wicket in that, you know, while I am very leery of care, uh, the Council on American Islamic Relations and those activist groups that want to further and further uh, impose uh, Islam and Sharia into American culture are very leery of that. But at the same time, uh, Islam and those that advocate for uh, Quranic teachings, sometimes they do have moral positions that I would agree with. Uh, you know, um, that homosexuality is immoral. Uh, we, we would agree on that. But nevertheless, um, and this is where uh, Dinesh voters and citizens have to really do the work of thought and and researching things um america i love america my goodness uh, dinesh you know me you know me very well and you know that i believe the bible is the word of god but i also believe that the u.s constitution the declaration bill of rights constitution were uh, at least on some level, superintended over by, by God. I really believe that, that it was so unlikely that in the 1700s that America could, uh, you know, birth itself and that our governing documents are so brilliant that they must be preserved. Now, let me um, illustrate why the radical Islam would be incompatible with this because, all right, one of our bedrock 
you know, presuppositions, as Lincoln said at Gettysburg, government of the people and by the people and for the people. In other words, the right to self-governance based on natural law. Um, you know, the the imams and the the worldwide caliphate that so many Muslims desire, the idea of self-governance and uh, that the there is the consent of the governed, oh my goodness, you know, uh, Mus- Muslims would not tolerate that for a moment. I mean, that alone, the idea of a representative republic and the vox populi, the voice of the people be heard, and that there is governance only by the consent of the governed, that, that stops the conversation about the compatibility of Islam and America right there. Uh, would you agree? No, I, I would not agree, and and here's why. Let's let's consider okay. a hypothetical. Let's consider a, a country like Jordan or Egypt for a moment, and um, let's say that you have a Muslim majority, which you do in those Muslim countries, right? right. And the Muslim majority, democratically and by consent of the governed and by majority rule, decides that they want to live under Sharia law. So in other words, we're talking here not about Sharia law imposed on an unwilling population, which uh, which maybe some Muslims, some radical Muslims do want, but I'm talking about the possibility of having a democratic republic where a Muslim majority decides that we choose collectively and democratically through majority rule and maybe with some exemptions for minority rights. You, if you don't want to live under Sharia, you can go to a normal court, but we also have these Sharia courts and we as a majority of Muslims want those. How would that be incompatible with a representative republic? Well, in a way, and this is a great point, and I appreciate your very thorough analysis of what I'm saying is that, but it's using freedom to curtail, if not ultimately eliminate freedom. Um, that, that's in a way what I believe the, the, the morally rudderless Democrats are doing right now. They're using the tools of liberty to ultimately chip away and eliminate liberty. Because ultimately, you know, Sharia really means the straight path. And uh, Islam, the, yes, there are uh, scenarios where non-Muslims in radically Muslim countries uh, have the option to not participate in Islam, but they have like demi status. And I mean, the rights of Christians and Jews or non-Muslims within radical Muslim cultures is, is pretty bleak indeed. And I mean, all you need to do is study uh, the the demi status of of non-Muslims. And um, clearly, uh, you know, they, they, people have the right to opt out and not be Muslim, but the price for having done so is, is rather severe. And what I say about America is this, that you, you don't have to be Christian. You don't have to even believe in God or be theistic. You don't have to be a straight heterosexual. But here's what we really can't let people do is tear down the foundation that allows people to be a non-Christian, non-hetero, non-binary person. In other words, here's what I'm saying. If you want what we've had, and what we've had has been stability, liberty, and prosperity in just immeasurable terms, liberty, stability, prosperity. If you want that, what gave us that should be preserved, and what gave us that, and it's been well-documented, past and present, has been a Judeo-Christian representative republic, uh, capitalism, and I know people will say, oh, capitalism has potential for abuse, I agree. Okay, let's call it principled capitalism. But I believe that you know anybody can come here and anybody can uh, believe whatever they want to believe, but in terms of the preservation of of our governing principles and even the documents themselves, we all have a vested interest in promoting the philosophical foundations of our constitutional republic, and that has been objective morality and, to be specific, a Judeo-Christian worldview, and that's just incompatible with an Islamic worldview. I'll be right back with Alex McFarland. Christmas is coming up, and if you're suffering from aches and pains, I cannot think of a gift that's better than feeling good again. Might even be better 
and getting a new car. So here's an idea, Relief Factor. It's the gift that helps people relieve pain and feel good once again. Relief Factor is a daily supplement. It helps your body fight back against pain. It's 100% drug-free. Relief Factor was developed by doctors searching for a better alternative for pain. Relief Factor uses a unique formula of natural ingredients like turmeric and omega-3s to help reduce or eliminate the everyday aches and pains you're experiencing. So whether it's neck, back, joint, or muscle pain, Relief Factor can help you feel better. And like pills that simply mask your pain for a short time, Relief Factor helps support your body's natural response to inflammation so you feel better all day, every day. See how Relief Factor can help you with their three-week quick start kit. It's only $19.95, and it comes with Relief Factor's Feel Better or Your Money Back Guarantee. So what do you have to lose? Visit relieffactor.com or call 800 for relief Again, the number 800 for relief or go to relieffactor.com. When you feel the difference, you know it works. I'm back with author and um, radio host and uh, apologetics director, uh, Alex McFarland, his website, alexmcfarland.com. Alex, you know, if the United States were anchored in the principles you describe, which I agree would be would be the best, but it seems to me, aren't you describing almost an America of old? And, and aren't you describing a set of principles that is now embattled, not because of Muslims, but really because of a radical secular left that is far more dangerous uh, to this Christian worldview than anything that Islam has to offer. In fact, you even said earlier that it could be that we have common cause with Muslims on a number of the socially conservative issues. And you mentioned only one gay rights, but I could think of others, including abortion. So let me ask you this. If you're, if you're faced with a choice, I've got a conservative Muslim over here, and I'm not talking about a terrorist or somebody wants to blow up a building. I'm just talking about a conservative Muslim over here. And let's even say that that guy would like in his own dream world to have America under Sharia, but but my majority rule. So in other words, he doesn't want to force it on you and me, but he wants to establish it democratically. And then over here, you've got a radical secular guy who doesn't accept this moral code at all, whether Muslim or Christian, uh, is actually far more concerned and more effective in propagandizing our young people, corrupting the values of our children, taking down monuments, I mean, basically destroying Western civilization as it has been known to exist for 2,000 years. Which would you rather ally with? <clears throat> well, that's a great point. Because while I, um, you know, I'm not a Muslim, I'm a Christian, and I don't believe in the uh, the the salvific promises of Islam. But at the same time, uh, I, I think your point is very well made. That honestly, um, there are scenarios in which a patriotic American probably, uh, let me say this, a principled conservative constitutionalist patriot. Uh, probably has more in compact with with a Muslim than many on the left. And this is the irony of what the Democrat Party has become. And and before we talk about specifics, let's talk about some presuppositions. Because, you know, uh, conservatism would say, look, there's an objective right and wrong, and people have a capacity to do things that are objectively evil. Now, liberals will say, and you can call it woke, liberal, the left, uh, what, whatever you want, but liberals generally believe that people are inherently good and there is not an objective moral code. Uh, liberals would also presuppose that if uh, one has food on their table, conversely, on the other side of the world, someone else is going hungry. It's this very much a finite high mentality. Um, and, and so part of what's wrong is that we've allowed a lot of the baseless presuppositions of the left to almost become axiomatic truth in, you know, daily life. Now, here's the thing. Um, they, they say, well, because America is not perfect, let's pull down all these statues. Because, you know, on day one, July, you know, 1776 or 1789 when the constitution got ratified 
Uh, we didn't have a global utopia on day one, therefore let's burn down the house. And honestly, um, I, I believe that the left, be, because look, it's you give an itch, they want a mile. There's never enough. There, there are never enough entitlements. We've never done enough. There, um, you know, reparations are never enough. I, Dinesh, I was debating uh, a, a black Democrat's uh, leader, and I, you know, I said, "Well, put a figure on the reparations." I said, "I disagree with reparations for slavery on a lot of levels," but I said, "So let's say whatever the check is, you know, a trillion dollars dispersed as you wish. Will that be enough?" Can we move on and can we stop accusing, you know, hardworking Caucasian conservatives of being, you know, racist? And he said, no, it, it will never be over. And I said, well, then why would I, why, why would I write that check? If, if reparations will not solve the problem, why I'd write the check? Now, here's my point. For liberalism, uh, wokeism, call it what you will without an objective moral compass and without the idea that people have accountability and responsibility for their actions and without the uh as washington would say the laws of nature and nature's god written on every heart um the, the left will always cannibalize america and so in that regard and i think we could all we could think of examples that um really i do think the woke, ideologically driven left is a greater threat to our constitutional republic than most Muslim citizens, um, because as I would, you know, you know, sincerely say, most Muslim citizens are not jihadists. Now there are jihadists, there are radical Muslims, but I, the the vast majority, and I've met hundreds, they just they're wanting to love their families, put food on the table, a, as we all are. But we're in a battle of worldviews, and it's a battle that every citizen should take seriously, and I would say especially those in positions of, of influence, clergy, educators, uh, leaders. We need to understand our nation and get out of our comfort zone and try to preserve it, because um, I really do think our constitutional republic is more at risk than it's ever been. We'll be right back with Alex McFarland. Mike Lindell and MyPillow are excited to bring you their biggest bedding sale ever. And just in time for Christmas, for a limited time, get the Giza Dream bed sheets for as low as $29.98, a set of pillowcases for only $9.98, and rejuvenate your bed with a MyPillow mattress topper for as low as $99.99. They also have blankets in a variety of sizes, colors, and styles. They even have blankets for your pets. Get duvets, quilts, down comforters, body pillows, bolster pillows, and so much more. All with the biggest discounts of the year and all happening now. They're also extending their money-back guarantee for Christmas until March 1st, 2024, making them the perfect gift for friends, family, and everyone you know. Go to MyPillow.com, use promo code Dinesh, or you can call 800-876-0227. Again, the number 800-876-0227. You get huge discounts on all the MyPillow bedding pro products, the Giza Dream bed sheets for as low as $29.98. Get all your shopping done now while quantities last. I'm back with Alex McFarland. We're um, talking about Islam and the American uh, Constitution. Uh, Alex, you said at the end of the last segment something I thought was very important, and that is that you made a distinction between sort of jihadi Muslims, and we're interpreting jihadi here in the sort of militaristic or, or violent sense, and let's call them traditional Muslims. So traditional Muslims would be millions of Muslims in India, or the majority of the population of Indonesia, which is Muslim but hasn't had the same kind of turbulence as a country like Iran or even or even Iraq. Now, you've got those Muslims, and some of those guys come to America, and what if they were to say to us as conservatives, listen, the American founders understood uh, that uh, Americans are going to disagree about theology. Now, admittedly, the American founders were talking about Christian theology. They were thinking about differences, not only between Catholic and Protestant, but different denominations of Protestantism. And so the American founders basically said, we can disagree about theology, but agree on morality. 
And so you could have laws that are based on morality, even if you disagree about the sacraments or you disagree about the Trinity, those are in the domain of revelation, but objective morality is in the domain of reason. And what if this Muslim I'm talking about goes on to say that on the moral issues, we largely agree with you. Uh, right. and, and even in most Muslim countries today, Muslims have, you know, one husband, one wife. So even though polygamy is permitted in theory under Islam, in reality, most Muslims have a normal wife or husband the same as we do. And Muslims certainly don't de deny that there are such things as a man and a woman. They don't think men can become women and vice versa. So this Muslim goes, we really belong not only in America, but we belong in the Republican Party. And if the Republican Party would only recognize that we ally with you on all the kind of moral and social issues that you care about, uh, why are you trying to distance yourself from us? Isn't that only hurting you politically and socially? Yeah, that that is a great question, and one of the one of the questions of of any social contract, or certainly casting a vote for a candidate, would be the, the um, comfort level that we're we're both acting in good faith. And and let me say this: and I'm only speaking for myself, but when it comes to voting for a candidate, uh, I I personally would have no problem voting for a Muslim candidate for an office. Now, let me say, not the presidency or or not um, perhaps sitting on, on a judicial bench, but, but you're right. And this is my favorite subject next to the gospel itself is natural law, because throughout human history, it's been well documented that different groups of people with different cultural norms and maybe different theological beliefs human beings have this moral awareness and it comports with uh, Exodus 21 through 17, the Ten Commandments. Uh, by the way, in 1950, uh, then President uh, Harry Truman was giving a speech to uh, attorney generals across America. And he said, it was very interesting, Harry Truman said that the, the basis of our government is drawn from Exodus, Isaiah, the Sermon on the Mount, and St. Paul. Now, what he meant by that, the Ten Commandments are found in Exodus, and the three branches of government uh, very likely uh, were drawn from Isaiah 43, 22, that speaks of God as prophet, priest, and king. And we've got our executive, legislative, and judicial branches, and the Sermon on the Mount, uh, the law of general benevolence and charity to one's neighbor, Romans 13, 1 through 7, civil government is sanctioned and ordained by God. Now, Here's the thing, this natural law constitutional republic that we enjoy, um, a, a, a Christian can support that, a Muslim can support that, because theological distinctives aside, we all agree on basic morality. So on, on that regard, I, I do think the Republican Party should embrace those Muslims that want to be politically active but there has to be a, a very sincere um, commitment on both parties that what we're about is the preservation of the U.S. Constitution and our 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 form of government. Uh, for instance, let me just say this: you know, First Amendment, uh, freedom of conscience, freedom of expression, the the you know, free speech, the right to freedom of religious expression. That must not be curtailed. And, and I've got to say this, Dinesh, um, and you and I have both spoken at you know, many college campuses, um, the, the left is more about selective tolerance and censorship than all the imams in the world, <laughs> you know? I, I mean, my goodness, if there's a group that is more Sharia than Sharia itself, it's the cancel culture wokeness. And, and I think they pose a bigger threat to our liberties than, than any Muslim in the United States. I think, and, and on that, we emphatically agree. Alex McFarlane, thank you very much for joining me. Very interesting conversation. Blessings to you, my dear friend. I'm now moving into a new chapter of Solzhenitsyn Gulag Archipelago. It's called The Supreme Measure. 
Now, what's the supreme measure? Capital punishment, execution, ending your life. And Solzhenitsyn begins this chapter with a, a little bit of a tour of the history of capital punishment in the in Russia. He wants to show that capital punishment was used by the czars. It whether or not it was allowed and to what degree or whether it was temporarily suspended depended on the particular czar. But nevertheless, the use of capital punishment was not all that frequent. It was often reserved for particular cases like people who tried to overthrow the government. Even when it was used more broadly for multiple offenses, the number of people executed under capital punishment wasn't that great. And Solzhenitsyn is contrasting the practice of capital punishment in the past with the widespread systematic use of capital punishment by the Soviet regime. What he's trying to say is that while Soviet propaganda basically makes the czarist period seem really oppressive, the czarist period was very uh, moderate, very mild, benign compared to the atrocities of the police state under the Soviet regime, under Stalin. So let's look at some of the details. Capital punishment, he writes, has had an up and down history in Russia. And that's a good way to put it. He says um, under um, the czar named uh, Alexei Mikhailovich, there were 50 five zero crimes that merited capital punishment. He goes under Peter the Great, there were 200. So it expanded more ways that you can get your head chopped off. And then he goes, yet the Empress Elizabeth, while she didn't repeal those laws, never once resorted to it. Not a single person executed under the regime of, um, of Elizabeth um, Petrovna. And then he goes on to say, um, he goes on to say that, uh, yeah, some people criticize Elizabeth. They say, well, she didn't do capital punishment, but guess what? She did flogging or she, she did this or she did that. Uh, she used eternal exile in Siberia. But Solzhenitsyn goes, well, that's better than capital punishment. If you give a guy a choice, you want to be exiled to Siberia or have your head chopped off. Probably a bunch of people will choose Siberia. And that shows that even though no one is saying that these, these czars didn't have stern punishments, they were kind of sparing, she was, in the use of capital punishment. He goes on to Empress Catherine the Great, and he says, well, she had capital punishment, but it was only for people who tried to overthrow the regime. If you try, tried to displace her government, get rid of her, then yeah, she thought, she thought capital punishment is a form of self-defense, meaning defense of her authority uh, against people trying to overthrow the throne and the system. But she goes, but if you're a normal criminal, uh, or if you're a non-political offender, nah, you're not going to get capital punishment. He talks about um, the long reign of Alexander I, and he says capital punishment was used only really for war crimes. And then he comes down to what I think is his critical point, which is that despite the ups and downs of this czar versus that czar, he goes, let's take a period of 30 years. He chooses the period between 1876 and 1904 because revolutionary fervor in, in Russia began around 1904. So he goes, let's look at the preceding 30 years. How many people in 30 years were executed by capital punishment? He counts 486. And then he does very Solzhenitsyn type math. He goes, in other words, about 17 people a year. It may seem like a large number. But he goes, we are now dealing with not just thousands, not just tens of thousands, but hundreds of thousands of people executed. Not every decade, not even every year, but sometimes every month, every month. So the scale of capital punishment is completely different. So he goes, it wasn't that capital punishment was restored under the Bolsheviks. He goes, instead, a new era of executions was inaugurated. And he gives a single example. He says, a group of farmers were sentenced to be executed uh, for the following crime. And that is, quote, after they finished mowing the collective farm with their own hands, they went back and mowed a second time to get a little hay for their own cows. And he goes, for that, they got the death penalty. And they didn't just get it, it was carried out. And then in an absolutely unusual explosion of rage, Solzhenitsyn writes, 
even if Stalin had killed no others, and let's remember, Stalin killed more people than Hitler. He goes, even if Stalin had killed no others, only these six people, I believe he deserves to be drawn and quartered just for the lives of those six peasants. And then he says, I know there are going to be communists who tell me, oh, how dare you say the Solzhenitsyn? How dare you disturb the great Stalin and so on? Stalin is a leader of the world communist movement. And he goes, no, Stalin is not the leader of anything. He's a criminal and he's a criminal on a grand scale. The peoples of the world remember him as a friend. That's, um, that's a communist talking to Solzhenitsyn. Here's Solzhenitsyn's reply. He goes, no, he's not a friend for the, of the people on whose backs he rode. So Solzhenitsyn very rarely refers specifically to Stalin in, in the Gulag. I've counted maybe four or five times that he does that. At one point, he talks later in the book about the death of Stalin. He calls him the autocrat. The autocrat was dead. So this is a rare time where he names Stalin and goes further and basically says, this guy needs to be cut into small pieces for his willingness to take a bunch of farmers who are trying to do nothing more than not even feed themselves, feed their own cows. And for that, for that, they get the death penalty. Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify, or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com.